Hello YouTube, this is Marco. I'm your Watch Cardinal bringing you another video here today. Another collection review talking about a very interesting and frankly speaking unique collection uh, that has no Rolex in the actual collection. And of course before I jump into anything, ironically enough, I am wearing uh, Rolex, the GMT Master 2, the Bruce Wayne as I like to call it. Love this watch. So this was a collection review sent to me by CB and uh, he wanted me to see if I could come up with a watch collection based off of kind of a sub collection with his, within his own collection of non Rolex watches and provided for the kind of viewers. And frankly, I really like this exercise. It is quite interesting. Um, and I think it is pretty cool. I think these kind of watch collections are really inspiring to see because they're so different from what the average collector tends to gravitate towards. And so, I really am, I think, inspired and also really intrigued by uh, the kind of choices people make, especially in collections that you just don't see every day. So he submitted a nine watch collection for review, and uh, these are what they are in order of the picture they appear. So the first is a Doxa 1500T, which he says is to wash the cars. He said the bracelet is very nice with the same microsystem as Omega, which is pretty cool. Breitling Avenger. Uh, is the next one with a carbon case, impossible to scratch and very light with a B12 in-house movement. The third is Omega Pro Cloth. Uh, it's two-tone titanium and rose gold, uh, which is, he says is amazingly comfortable despite the size. I don't know, I have a bit of a hard time believing that, but that's just my personal opinion. The AP, the next is AP 42 millimeter Navy on the original Croc strap. Uh, the fifth watch is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms in rose gold, the flyback chrono with a Frederick PJ movement. Amazing, absolutely excellent. Sixth watch is the Grand Seiko Peacock, which is, I would say, one of, if not the best Grand Seikos to get. So that is pretty, pretty great. Next is the Pam 371 Titanium GMT in 47 millimeters. Uh, a little bit big if I'm being honest with you, but it does look great on his wrist. Uh, next is a blonde pant white gold triple date, uh, which he says is not his cup of tea, but it was a gift 17 years ago. And the last but not least is a Constantin Chiakin Joker watch in titanium, which he says is a piece unique. So I must admit that is a pretty stunning collection. It is definitely not what you see every day and definitely something a little off the beaten path, which I really admire and respect. And Man, frankly speaking, you really got the kind of gears in my mind turning a little bit in terms of where your collection could go. So um, what do I think first and foremost of the collection? I think I respect this kind of collector who looks at watches, again, from an objective standpoint and doesn't really buy into the kind of hype that surrounds, you know, a lot of your steel Rolex watches uh, because they're mainly... Uh, desirable for the rarity and scarcity that they have and ultimately the financial component in that you can sell them for a profit. So what I think of the collection, I think it's fantastic, but there are some changes I would make overall to the collection. So let's get into it. So in terms of the keepers, what would I keep? The first that I would keep is actually the Doxa. Uh, first of all, it's not a super expensive watch and I think it is a very good beater. It's a watch that you can probably take with you on vacations if you choose. So I think that's really a great watch just as a bang around, bash about, do anything kind of watch. I would keep it. I mean, you can't really sell it for a huge, you know, premium anyways. It's not a ridiculously expensive watch. So I would say I would keep that. Next, I would keep the AP. As most people know, AP is not my cup of tea, but I do respect uh, the Royal Oak and kind of its place in the world of watchmaking uh, and its importance, obviously, in the watch industry. So I would definitely keep it. I think that now that you do have it, I would definitely not get rid of it. The next I would keep is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Chronograph in rose gold. I think it's just a little bit cool. A uh, chronograph in rose gold diver. It doesn't, if I'm being honest with you, it doesn't entirely make sense. In my opinion, you know, you don't really see a Submariner chronograph. I think that Blancpain falls prey a lot to what kind of Tudor does with the Black Bay and that I think the 50 Fathoms is about 35 or 45 percent of all the revenue Blancpain makes. So they have Blancpain Divers, Blancpain Chronograph, Blancpain 50 Fathoms Complication, and, and they'll just all mix it together and it doesn't really make sense. But I do like, and just full transparency, I really do like the look of it. Uh, and I think it's just something cool and different. So I wouldn't get rid of that. I would keep also the Grand Seiko Peacock because I think that's probably one of the best Grand Seikos uh, money can buy. 
And last but not least, I would keep uh, the, no, sorry, there's two more watches I would keep. I would keep the Panerai, uh, just because, again, it's another great beater watch, GMT, so that's another great option if you want to take it while traveling, as well as a diver. I think that's great. And the last but not least, I would keep the Constantin Giacchin Joker watch, because it is a piece unique. It is very cool and interesting, and just a little bit different. So, I think uh, when I look at this collection, right, those are the keepers within it. Now, I'm not going to factor in any kind of sentimental value. I know he says he doesn't sell watches. He just adds more. But what I would do within this collection, there's nine pieces. I would actually increase it to 15. That would be kind of my goal. Uh, but I would keep those, I think I just mentioned seven watches, right? I would keep those seven watches, upgrade certain pieces, and add some things that I feel uh, you may be missing a little bit. So the ones I'd keep again are the Doxa, the AP Chrono, the Bomb Paint, 50 Fathoms Chrono, the Grand Seiko Peacock, uh, the Pam GMT and the Constantin Chiak and Joker watch. So that's six pieces right there. Next, I would replace the Blom, uh, the excuse me, the Breitling Avenger uh, for a different chronograph. I would get uh, in particular a Zenith El Primero. I think that the story behind the Zenith El Primero is just a little bit more interesting. Frankly speaking, it's a much uh, better watch, and you can get these for a ridiculously good bargain on the secondary market. I would say even the Breitling and the Zenith might be you know kind of similar pricing in that regard so uh, obviously for those of you who don't know the story of the zenith el primero uh really starts back as one of the first i won't claim it's the first because i believe seiko was secondly the first uh, to make an automatic chronograph movement but zenith was one of the first to create an automatic chronograph movement or at least one that was kind of a high horology uh automatic chronograph movement and, and it was almost lost so the story goes that Obviously, during the quartz crisis, everybody thought that, you know, quartz was the future and really mechanical watches didn't really have a place in the watch industry anymore. And so what Zenith decided to do was kind of get rid of all the tools and equipment that were necessary to build these El Primero movements. And there was a watchmaker, his name is Charles Vermont, who uh, actually took all the tools, the parts, the components, the know-how, uh, the schemes and everything that you needed to actually build the movements and he hid them along with his brother-in-law in an attic. And that attic could actually be visited today, the Zenith attic. Um, and I think that's just such a cool story because he ultimately saved the Zenith brand and the El Primero movement, which was featured in so many incredible watches, uh, one of them being obviously the Rolex Daytona. I think it's a, a piece that is truly underappreciated nowadays in the watch industry. And I think it's one that really belongs in a collection like this. So the one I would like in particular is the 38 millimeter, the manufacturer edition. Now it, it is a little bit smaller, granted, but I love those tricolored blue sub dials. That was a dial they actually found recently in the attic. Now they made it available only to the Zenith manufacturer in Switzerland. Uh, so when you would visit them, you would be able to buy uh, the Zenith uh, manufacturer watch. However, you can buy these online because obviously the pandemic doesn't allow people to travel. So they've made it available uh, for purchase online. I think that would be a great pickup. Again, the story of Zenith is so cool and it would just bring your collection again a little bit to a higher standard because I just think the Breitling doesn't really belong. I don't love it in the collection. It's just not a watch that I think I really enjoy. So I would really replace it uh, for a Zenith El Primero Manufacturer Edition. Next is I would replace actually the Ploprof. I would just get a standard blue Seamaster Professional 300. I think that's a great watch. It's on a metal bracelet, which I feel is important because you don't have actually that many watches on metal bracelets. So I think adding another one that's just maybe a little bit more wearable, if we're being honest with one another, is um, is definitely to your advantage. So I would replace the Ploprof uh, for the Seamaster Professional, again in blue. Uh, and it would tie up, it, it would free a lot of money because obviously it is a two-tone Ploprof, which isn't a cheap watch, you know what I mean? These are pretty expensive, so I think that money could ultimately uh, be used elsewhere and you would be getting a fantastic kind of trade-off and a great watch in the Seamaster Professional. Next, I would replace the Blancpain Triple Calendar with something a little bit left field. So at least as of recently, I've been really diving into what I like to call the independent and micro-independent space. And one of the brands that has really gotten my attention is Urban Jurgensen. So the story of Urban Jurgensen is it started with the father of Urban, who was Jurgen Jurgensen. And he actually made watches and apprenticed under John Arnold and um, 
Abra and Louis Breguet, which are two of probably uh, the most important watchmakers in watchmaking history. And uh, Urban Jurgensen took all that know-how and apprentice under his father and took all that know-how to ultimately uh, create the brand. And now, as of today, a lot of the watches that they create are in the kind of same vein that they were in the past, but with their own kind of design and flair. And they've worked with a number of terrific watchmakers, some of the very best in the world, the Kerry Budalinens, uh, the late great Derek Pratt. And so I think they do have a lot of gems. So one of the watches that I would recommend you replace the Blancpain Triple Calendar with is a watch that was recently featured on A Collected Man, which I really like, but it's not the one that I would get specifically. It's the Urban Jurgensen Perpetual. It's called the Reference 2, I believe, made by Derek Pratt. So the dial are actually made by Derek Pratt. It's got a Frederick Piguet Perpetual Calendar movement. So you'd be upgrading from a, um, a kind of triple calendar to a perpetual calendar, which I feel is a worthy upgrade. And you would get a dial that was made by you know, kind of one of the best contemporary watchmakers, you know, of all time. I mean, Derek Pratt, the only reason he really doesn't get recognition is because his contemporary was George Daniels, right? And he got a lot of the notoriety and recognition that Derek Pratt unfortunately didn't get. But Derek Pratt was a phenomenal watchmaker in his own right. And he's, at least in, from what I've read and what I've, you know, kind of heard, he's the one to credit for kind of the observatory hands, the cowhorn style lugs, uh, that I love in kind of Kerry Voodoo line and, but that are also used in Urban Jurgensen. So I would be getting the reference too. Now the, the one they featured on A Collected Man was in Platinum. It, it was about 40,000 if I remember correctly, which is a lot of money, but one could be had in yellow gold. And I think it's actually a lot nicer and it's a lot more available because the Platinum ones, I think there's only maybe 10 circulating in the entire world. So they're very rare, but the yellow gold ones are a little bit less rare. They're a little bit less expensive also. I've seen them floating around in the high 20s to kind of low 30s, which I think is a terrific deal because you get a beautiful perpetual calendar, a dial made by Derek Pratt, again, one of the best watch contemporary watchmakers uh, there is. And I love that dial. It's got like a copper, almost salmon-like hue, like a rose gold hue. I think it's just absolutely stunning. And I think it would be such a great addition and a worthy addition uh, to the collection. If you choose not to go that way, I think there's another, also a couple other great option. One of them is by Breguet. It's the 7337. So it's got a day date complication with a moon, moon phase. What's great again is it's a Frederick Piguet movement. Fantastic. It's almost like a three quarter movement, which I think is just beautiful. But the real stunner is the uh, dial, which has a triple guilloche finish. I think that watch just does not get enough credit and enough publicity. I think it's absolutely one of the nicest watches that Breguet has ever made. And it's a watch that was highly inspired by uh, an old pocket watch made by the man himself, Abraham Louis Breguet. So I think that's a great option. And last but not least, the one that I would go for if you wanna to stick to Urban Jurgensen is the Alfred. That's a watch that I've been looking at, you know, to purchase myself. I think it's phenomenal value considering what you're getting. You're getting the distinct case shape, lug shape, uh, and, and styling of an Urban Jurgensen, but really for a fraction of the price. I mean, the finish on the movement, it's got the beautiful Cote de Soleil, 72 hour power reserve, in-house movement. Uh, the only thing that's different is that it has a Swiss lever escapement as opposed to the Denton escapement that Derek Pratt made. Uh, but that watch, the Alfred itself, uh, was made in collaboration between Kerry Voodelinen and Jean-Francois Moujean from Chronode, who's also you know, kind of a phenomenal watchmaker in his own right, works with a lot of the big independents like Moser and MBNF. And um, yeah, I think that's a great budget option, but if I had to pick the one that I would replace your Blancpain triple calendar would be the Urban Jurgensen reference too. And I like it in particular in yellow gold with that copper style. I think that would be such an unbelievable watch in the collection. Now in terms of uh, replacements, I'm done. So we have the keepers, we have the replacements, and there's three watches that I would like to add to the collection. Sorry, it's not a 15 watch collection. It's in fact a 12 watch collection. So the first one I feel you're missing is a blue dial dress watch. And again, I'm looking for things that are, you know, relatively affordable, but that fit in the collection because they're a little bit different, maybe a little underappreciated, and frankly speaking, are still unbelievable watches. And one of them is the H. Moser Mosaic. And I like the one in particular in blue. I feel that you're missing a blue dial dress watch. I don't really see one in the collection. And so I would love for you to kind of scratch that itch with the Moser 
uh, in particular the blue mosaic dial because it is a blue dial. It's got a mosaic dial, which I think is just so funky. It's beautiful. It's got that fume effect, but also I think it's just incredible because it's a hand engraved uh, mosaic dial, which I think is just stunning. And again, you get a high level of finish and beautiful watch overall, beautiful case, beautiful uh, movement. I think that's a phenomenal watch. I think that would be an amazing addition to the collection. The next watch I would add is a steel uh, Cartier Santos, just a simple white dial. Again, I feel you're just missing a couple watches on metal bracelets just to have that variety and versatility. Uh, I think the Santos is a great watch. It's the original men's wristwatch. It was also, I mean, you can call it the first real sports watch in that fa in that regard because obviously it was technically an aviation watch and the first pilot watch. So uh, I think that a beautiful steel white dial Cartier Santos would be an amazing addition to the collection. Again, to increase your kind of uh, inventory, at least within the collection, of watches on a metal bracelet, which I feel you are missing. Now, the last one was actually a little bit difficult. And again, I wanted to pick something that was uh, not your usual, not your ordinary, and I wasn't sure what to pick. And I looked at the collection and saw, you know, you've got so many incredible watches. I would want to build up on something that is high horology, but that is a little bit different. And when I look at a collection like this, I think of somebody who is, you know, just not your average Joe, right? They like things that are a little bit different, a little atypical. And the watch that I felt was perfect for this, this kind of collection to finish it off and cap it off was the Vacheron Historiques 1921. You get a beautiful, I like the one in rose gold. You get a beautiful rose gold case. I think that's highly discounted and on the secondary market. And yet you get a tremendous amount of watch. I think it looks beautiful. I love the asymmetry of the dial. The braggy hands are absolutely incredible. And it's got that beautiful movement, manual wind movement, uh, Kerry Budelainen is highly praising of that movement, says that it'll be very easy to service down the line, beautifully finished in the kind of valet de jeu style that you would expect. Uh, and of course, it's got the Geneva seal on it. Those, I think, are just tremendous value. And I could just see you kind of on those fall, summer, spring uh, kind of days getting into maybe a Porsche, maybe a Jaguar, maybe an Aston Martin, and just driving around with that watch on the wrist. You just have your hand on the steering wheel and you just look at that asymmetrical dial. I think that is just a romantic idea and romantic story that, you know, I just couldn't get out of my head. And I think in that regard, I would add the Vacheron Historiques 1921 just to cap off the collection. I think it would be a perfect crown jewel. Again, you're getting a Holy Trinity watch that's a little bit different, a little bit atypical and not what you would see in every collection. So those are my picks, guys. I hope you enjoyed uh, today's video. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments about my picks. Did you like them? Did you disagree with them? Uh, would you swap anything else? And of course, feel free to leave your own suggestion down in the comments. Guys, I really love these kind of collections because they are not what you see every day. And they're a little bit different from what you see from a lot of collectors, you know, kind of in passing, especially if you are in a space and in a community like myself where a lot of people have steel Rolex. So guys, that's the, that's really it for today's video. I really do appreciate the time that you've afforded me watching the video. I would ask for you to like the video, to subscribe for more in the future. And of course, guys, my name is Marco. I'm your watch cardinal, and I'll see you guys in the next one.